بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله today's Sira session we will talk about first a little bit of summary of the last week's talk and then talk about life in Medina that includes uh, the first phase. O obviously, we'll talk just a part of the first phase, not going to go all the way. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, need to be covered in the first phase as well. Um, and uh, within the first phase, I'll just talk about uh, the reality of the Medina uh, at that time, when Rasulullah migrated from Mecca to Medina. Uh, so we'll talk about the status quo of Medina, uh, the categories of people that were in Medina at that time, then we'll talk about the companions' life in, uh, in Mecca compared to Medina, and then we'll talk about Medina as well. And uh, uh, when, when we talk about the Medina, of course, we'll talk about a little bit how the Islam was revealed to Rasulullah in a gradual manner. Um, so I, I will talk about what does it mean by gradual revelation of the Quran on Rasulullah and what does it mean? Because uh, there is some misconceptions around uh, gradualism in Islam. Uh, they, had, they, had, they, they need to be clarified. And uh, then uh, the polytheists, that are the mushrikeen, they were living in Medina. Then the Jews in Medina. So these were the three categories of people who were living in Medina. So we'll talk a little bit about them. And then two of the reports about the, the people who were, who were Jew in the beginning. And they did become Muslim, and they reported certain aspects of, uh, of the life of the Jews in Medina as well. OK. So now, as far as uh, the previous week goes, we talked about uh, the story of Umm Ma'abad a little bit, Abu Buraida Aslami, how he entered into full Islam and he brought about 70 uh, people along with him who entered into full Islam. He's the one who was following Rasulullah to, uh, to get the bounty on the head of Abu Bakr and Rasulullah. And then how Rasulullah arrived in Medina. We talked about that. First, he went to Quba and then to Medina. And how Ansar were very keen to. Host Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and even the Sahaba as well, uh, and then uh, the f the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that also came to Medina, and how Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam made the dua for the people uh, of the Mecca or the immigrants who came to Medina for the sake of Islam, and they were not feeling well; they were getting sick. Uh, especially the report talks about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu an and Bilal radiyallahu anhuma. And uh, uh, they were uh, remembering the life they used to have in Mecca. And Rasulullah made a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make uh, the people, uh, the, the muhajireen, love Medina as they love Mecca, or even more than they love, uh, they, they love Mecca as well. Um, and then, uh, inshallah, today we'll move into the life in Medina. So if you look at, as, as the book also talks about, life in Medina, and, uh, it, can be, it can be divided into three different phases. Uh, and that's more for uh, uh, understanding certain aspects of it. And as I mentioned before as well, when we talked about the Makkah life as well, you see that uh, the historians, they divide the life of Rasulullah in Makkah into different phases as well, different stages. Uh, it's important for us to know those stages so, so we know that how Rasulullah progressed in Mecca to, to a point where Rasulullah and the Sahaba were ready to migrate to Medina and establish the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal over there. And they start living the life according to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first phase, but, so when we look into Medina, we see the first phase is, of course, it starts from migration until the Sulah Hudaybiyah or the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And uh, the reason of this uh, 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 division of the life in Medina that way is to understand that this is the time the Muslims were still continuously being attacked by the Meccans. They were not letting them live their lives. And uh, once this treaty was, uh, was established, well, was done with the Meccans, uh, Rasulullah uh, and the Sahaba, they had kind of a a free hand now to not to worry about the Meccans now. Now the da'wah can be expanded to other parts of the world as well. As we will read about, inshallah, that Rasulullah after that, he started taking this da'wah of Islam to the rest of the world. He started sending the letters to the kings 
uh, that includes, for example, Heraclius, uh, the king of uh, Rome, Byzantines, uh, the king of Kisra, uh, the, uh, the Kisra, the king of Persians, and uh, the Ghassan, the king of Egypt, which was Nokokas, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and on and on. And we know that the Habasha also, the Mujashi, the king actually became Muslim. Uh, as we know of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he even prayed uh, uh, the Salatul Janazah for him, which is called the Absentee Salatul Janazah. Okay, so that's happened after in the second phase. And until the Fath Makkah or the conquest of Makkah happened. Now once the conquest of Makkah happened, uh, that was because the Kuffar of the Makkah, they broke the treaty that they made with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, of the Hudaybiyyah. Now after that, they, they, they broke the treaty, the, uh, the Makkah was open for Islam and Muslims entered there. And, uh, and the third stage started, and the, 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 so the second stage goes, starts from Hudaybiyyah, until the conquest of Mecca. Third stage is started from the conquest of Mecca, and then we see the people, the, uh, uh, the people started entering into Islam in groups, big numbers, uh, as the, the surah that was revealed, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسُلُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا So they were entering into uh, Islam in afwaj, afwaj uh, meaning the, in huge numbers, and uh, we know that how fast the Islam expanded after the conquest of Mecca. We can imagine that from the numbers as we... Uh, and actually, for, after Sulaim Hudaybiyah, the numbers started increasing very quickly. Hudaybiyah, Muslims were only about 1,400 who were going for the Umrah. Different numbers are mentioned. Some say 14, some say 1,500, some say 1,700. Whichever number we take, it was less than 2,000 numbers. So, and then with, le with less than two years, when the conquest of Mecca happens, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered in Mecca with the army of 10,000. So the number increased so much. And then after the conquest of Mecca, we see that Rasulullah did not perform the first Hajj. He performed the Hajj the following year. The first one was led by Umar Abu Bakr Siddiq and then the second Hajj that happened after the conquest of Mecca, Rasulullah himself led that. And in that Hajj, there were about 124,000 according to one report, and according to another report, 144,000 Muslims uh, perform the Hajj with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just showing the number, when it says, the ayah says, the Muslims are entering in Afwaj, in huge groups. That, that's because of uh, how the Islam was expanding. So these are the three different distinct stages we can see in Medina life. Now, when you talk about the status quo of, uh, of the Muslims, uh, or, uh, uh, or, or the, uh, of the people in Medina, at the time of the immigration, um, so, Number one to, thing to remember, this immigration, as we have, I have mentioned many, many times, but it's very important to, to, to keep in mind. This was not just for the Sahaba and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to escape the oppression of the Meccans. Medina was a place where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent the Sahaba ahead of time to prepare the grounds in Medina. They were working there. To, uh, to, in a manner that, like uh, as we talked about Musa ibn Umar an, and Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Maktoum. These two were sent as uh, the, uh, the envoys or the ambassadors from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Medina to uh, convey the Islam to the people to the point that there were enough people uh, became Muslim that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was commanded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala now to migrate to Medina. And why? Because now they gave the Nusra to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they gave him the support to come and rule over us. And now uh, keep this in mind when we talk about the status quo because this very same thing is the one that caused people like Abdullah, uh, uh, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, uh, one of the hypocrites, uh, the, the leaders of the hypocrites, they, he, uh, he became a hypocrite because he was a mushrik but he became uh, uh, he, he uh, apparently he showed that he became he, he accepted Islam, but he continued to be a non-Muslim. Now this uh, person uh, was going to be crowned as a king of Medina, even though also the Khazar were fighting, and they agreed on him to be the king at that point. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he entered into Medina, it was as if it was a coup against Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, and he he kept that grudge until he died. And hence, he, he, he lived his life, uh, like, uh, the life of a hypocrite. Now, anyways, so, when, uh, so Muslims, when they entered, they entered with this idea that they are there not just to run away. Yes, that freed them from the oppression of the Meccans. That, that is very true. 
Now in Medina, they had the upper hand because now they are the one who were in power or authority. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, sorry. the categories of people in Medina, they were of three types. Uh, there were three types. Uh, one was, of course, the companions of Rasulullah That included two, two categories, right? The one was Al-Ansar, and the other one was Al-Muhajirun. Al-Ansar were the people who were the residents of Medina, who were already there, uh, and they accepted Islam. And uh, within those companions, there was another group of people who were Al-Muhajirun, who were the immigrants. Now, uh, See, we talked about last week also, but it's, it's, it's important to understand uh, that it, it, even those Muslims, they called themselves, or they were referred as Al-Ansar wal Muhajirun. So, be, being a Muslim is one aspect of it. Of course, our identity is Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huwa sammakum al-Muslimin. That, that He has named you Muslimin. But within that, just to recognize each other, they could be considered called Al-Ansar, they could be called Al-Muhajirun. And similarly, there were people like uh, Salman Al-Farisi, right? Uh, the one from Faris. Uh, so it's, uh, similarly, we see Bilal Habashi, or uh, 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 Abu Dar Ghaffari from Ghaffar, and Suhaib Rumi, the one from Rum, and on and on and on. So these titles are attached the way they are from, or the, this characterization can happen, but this is only for recognition, not more than that, just so we can recognize the group of people. And this is why we consider them as we refer them to Al Ansar, Al Muhajirun, even. So just to recognize them, not more than that. Okay? Now, the second category of people were Mushrikeen. There were still Mushrikeen there. Okay? There were people who were Mushrikeen, means polytheists. The one who did not accept Islam, I will talk about a little bit when we go into details of that. And the third category were, was Jews. So these are the three main groups they were living in Medina. Even though Rasulullah is there as a ruler, but there are different people still there, the people who belong to different religions even at that time. Okay? Now, this is the kind of a dwelling uh, they were living in Medina. Uh, in the book, if you guys have it, or uh, you can just download it, this uh, image is over there that shows uh, 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 where the, each main groups of uh, people were living in. Uh, that includes, for example, the, uh, the groups of Jews were in general or on the outskirts of Medina. And uh, inshallah, I'll, I'll remember uh, to bring this picture again when we talk about some of the battles because it's important to understand the uh, circumstances those battles happen and why some of the, 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 some of the decisions made by Rasulullah were made at that time. Like, for example, I, and I think if you guys, any of you have taken. Uh, Middle Eastern history or that kind of course here. So probably they talk about the life of Rasulullah as well, yeah? And they talk about Banu Quraida, the tribe of the Jews. And uh, this idea, even until today, many of the Jews will bring it up uh, when they talk about their history along with the history of the Muslims, that the treatment of Rasulullah against the Banu Quraida. But when you look at the, the, the geographic location of them, which is... Uh, Right here, Banu Quraida. Okay? And um, they were. I'm going ahead of time. I should not talk about that. When we reach to Banu Quraida time, uh, we'll talk about that. But I just want to show you that look, there is a. The whole entrance to Medina was from the side of the Banu Quraida. Okay? And uh, they actually betrayed Rasulullah and uh, that, that, that could have caused uh, all the Muslims to be wiped out from Medina at that time. But we'll talk about that when we get to that point. Okay, now the companion's life in Mecca, to, to remember, uh, when the Muslims uh, and Rasulullah they were in Mecca, their life was, uh, uh, of course, becoming tougher and tougher, uh, and there was different kinds of abuse that the Sahaba and Rasulullah were going through. That included physical abuse, mental uh, uh, torture, psychological torture, uh, uh, financial uh, sanctions that were placed on Rasulullah and Sahaba. If you remember the boycott that happened for about three years, uh, that all the Muslims and the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even the ones who were not Muslim at that time, they had to go through the boycott. Except one member of the family, which was Abu Lahab. Okay, he is the one who was was very open against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
uh, and uh, he is the one who was not going through a boycott. He was among the people who, were, uh, who caused a boycott against the Muslims. Okay, so in Mecca, they were going through very difficult times. So compared to that life, now when they migrated to Medina. Now, so now uh, it's, everything changed. It's no more the leaders of the Quraysh or the, leader, uh, the Meccans, Kuffar, they are the ones who are causing the harm to the Muslims or anything. Now Muslims are the ones who have the authority. Even though there are three different distinct groups living in Medina, including Muslims, Polytheists and the Jews, but the upper hand was uh, uh, was, uh, 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 was to, to belong to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the one who was in authority. He is the one who had political and spiritual leadership of Medina. He is the main leader of uh, of the Medina now. Now, as we can see, that uh, of course the society would not just change in one day like that. Things would not change in one day. Yeah. Now. This is the part I want to stress here a little bit, that if it doesn't change, what does it mean? Does that mean that we have to gradually change the society, which is called tadrij or tadarruj? Or is it going to be, well, the system of life can be changed in one day, but uh, when it comes to the implementation, of, of obviously implementation only happens when the need arises. If the need is there, you apply those rules. If the need is not there, you don't apply those rules. This is simple, simple as that. The issue comes in, problem comes up, you have to know the solution. Where do you go back and find a solution? So the, when it comes to that, of course, as Muslims, we go back to, the, the, to Islam and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Islam says about that. So when it says that it takes time for a society to transform, it doesn't mean that Muslims were living in a Kufa society, or now they, uh, they have the authority, they continue to apply non-Islamic laws. This is not what we saw in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more, what it means by that. Uh, and actually, there's, there's some of the... Uh, uh, so when, uh, when it comes to the change in the society, uh, this was through Rasulullah Sallallahu Of course, Rasulullah Sallallahu was the messenger of Allah, and he is the one who was teaching the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبِلْ لَفِي دَلَالِ مُبِينَ So here Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is among you who recites to them the ayatihi, the, 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 the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and purify them and uh, teach them from the book of Allah and al-hikmah, the wisdom, sometimes people think wisdom means now you use your own mind to come up with something. You, uh, and I will, it happened to be, I gave the khutbah last Friday in one of the masajid, talking about the, just the subject of hikmah. Allah Azza wa Jalla has used this term al-hikmah in the Quran 20 times. And everywhere, the word hikmah means either the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sharia of Rasulullah the, the, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it means the prophethood, or it means the understanding of the revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. It's very tightly connected to the wahi. It does not mean that wisdom means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something from us and we suddenly we can become wiser. <laughs> that yes, Allah wants something, but I think or we think something else can be better than what Allah has revealed. No, it's never the case. Wisdom means that we have, wisdom is connected to the revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal always. In the, when, it, when we talk about the Quran, yes, wisdom can be, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us aql, Allah has given us the mind to use, but can it uh, supersede or can it bypass or can it be the, better than what Allah has revealed? No, of course not. So we should not be thinking of this way that if something becomes difficult for us to do, so hikmah is. Oh, don't do it. No, it's, it can never be hikmah. If Allah has commanded us to do something, that is the hikmah that we stick with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do. Okay? Um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, this is the mindset, okay, so of, the, of the believers. So we understand even when we talk about the gradualism, how Islam revealed to the Muslims gradually. Yes, the, the wahi was revealed gradually does not mean the implementation was gradual. 
implementation of Dean was whatever rules were there, they were implemented uh, as a whole. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about the believers that what kind of a people were these believers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Mumin al that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, about the believers that these are the people when the uh, when the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are, are recited, recited, recited to them, Zadatum uh, Imanan Rabbihim okay? that, that, that these are the people when the ayat, the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited to them, these are the ones whose iman increases as the verses are given to them and they rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So see this mindset has to be there to understand this whole concept of that whenever any hukum of Allah was revealed, they were there to execute, they were not there to make uh, compromises or coming up with excuses. Okay, uh, this is not the subject today, but I just want to mention it. When we talk about the Quran, uh, yes, the Quran was revealed over a 23 year period of time, as the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu talks about, and we know of from the seerah as well. Um, and the kuffar actually, they used to say to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why the Quran was not revealed as, uh, you know, uh, in one time, in one shot. Uh, why is it? So Allah Subh'ala replied to them that, it is so, uh, uh, it, it is useful for us. Like, as a matter of fact, this is a mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal that the Quran was re- not re- given to Rasulullah as a book, one book, go take it and apply it. Rather, the verses were revealed according to the circumstances. So now we even know the circumstances of those verses when they were revealed. So as the situation came up, the verses were revealed about that. So that gives us the asbab nuzul that gives us the cause of revelation. Hence, now we can apply for the newer things that come up as well if they were not present in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And and it's not contradictory to this when Allah subhanahu wa taala says in nanzalnahu fi laylatul qadr that we reveal this book on the laylatul qadr because it's kind of confusing now, right? We say we all know Quran was revealed over 23 years. So why is it saying that? It was revealed on, uh, uh, on Laylatul Qadr. Or another place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna fi Laylatul Mubarakah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it was revealed on the Laylatul Mubarakah. The blessed night, which is again Laylatul Qadr. Why is it saying that? So about that, uh, there are, uh, the, uh, the, the Mufassirin discussed this, uh, this uh, it means is the Quran was revealed from Allah uh, Mahfud to the first heaven on that night. This is one understanding. Second one says, that the Quran was revealed over uh, uh, to Rasulullah Sallallahu the first time was the Laylatul Qadr. That's another understanding. And uh, the rest of the Quran was revealed in stages. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Wanazalna alayk al Wanazalna alayk al Kitab." To be an alikul shayi. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying that "Nazalna the 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 word "Nazalna" the the one who know the Arabic they they would know when you use ashadda. Like that, it has two meanings. One can be it is for emphasis, and other is when it comes over the time. So again and again something happens. So the Quran was revealed in pieces. So the, uh, Allah is saying both. So it was revealed as a book, and then it's saying over the time in pieces. Uh, so uh, 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 the sh- short answer is that both the understandings can be taken together that the Quran was revealed uh, as, a, as a whole, or even it could be as a whole, at the same time, the first revelation was on Laylatul Qadr, okay? Um, so it, 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 the, the revelation was gradual, that is true, whether it's the Quran or the Sunnah on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because as the situation was coming up, the rulings were coming up. And Sahaba and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we find them, they used to wait if there is an action they wanted to undertake and the ruling was not there. And I can back it up with some of the incidents that we probably know may not pay attention to. Uh, like the example of uh, the story of three Sahaba, Ubay bin, Ka'ab bin Malik and the uh, other two. You know, the one who stayed behind in Ghazwat al-Tabuk. If anybody knows, uh, you know, okay. So these three Sahaba stayed behind, right? 
but there was no ruling about them because they came out and they say accepted their mistake, they stayed behind. And now, for about 50 days, they go through a very difficult time. This is the longest hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari about the story of Ka'b bin Malik and other two Sahaba who stayed behind in Tabuk. Uh, so obviously it's a longer story, we're not going to go through it today. When it, when it comes to Tabuk time, we'll talk about that. But the point is, they waited for the hukum from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the rule was revealed regarding the people like them. They went through very difficult times and there was actually some punishment from Rasulullah sallallahu at that time. Uh, similarly, the incident of ifq, which is about Aisha radiallahu anha, that there was accusation against the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And they waited, even this is the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu They waited for the command from Allah azza wa jal, and then the decision was made about that issue. And same way we find many other incidents like that. But on contrary to that, whenever rule was revealed, Sahaba were, they right away they implemented. For example, the ruling of liquor or kham. It's not liquor, intoxicant. Yeah? There's a misunderstanding that those rules, the, the liquor or the, the khamr was made haram in stages. This is incorrect. Because the khamar was made haram in one shot. Why am I saying that? Because the ayat prior to that, whether it's about there are less benefits and there are more harm in the khamar, or the one that talks about uh, that la taqrabu salat wa antur sukara, that don't go near salah while you are drunk. That ayat is not about drinking at all actually. This is just talking about the conditions of the salah. It doesn't make khamar haram in any way. It's a condition of salah, like salah is not valid if you don't have wudu. Or you are in the state of nijasa or impurity. <laughs> Same way, if at that time when it was halal, when it was halal, the khamar, sahaba used to drink. As another report talks about that, when I will talk about that one. Uh, uh, so that, that was, uh, when we talk about drinking, it was allowed, it was halal at that time. The only time it became haram, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about to do the istanibu, yeah, to, to stay away from that. Because this term is used for haram categories. Yeah? Now, when this ayah was revealed, and there are some uh, reports that talk about Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he's waiting for it. Some clarity, direct ruling about the khamr because none of them are saying it's haram. So, when the ayah of being haram came, one report talks about that Anas bin Malik, عنه, uh, he is one of those people who was serving uh, in the so Sahaba were drinking, and the report says some of them had the cups touching their lips and they dropped it, the cup. Some of them had the, the, the khamr in their mouth, they spit it out. And some who already drank, they put the finger in their throat so they can throw up. The moment the ruling about haram came, even though what they drank, they drank at that time. But they were so keen to apply the ruling, they did not say, oh, we have to go by stages or something. No, once the rule came, they stopped. And the same thing with the hadith that talks about the, 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 the hijab for the women. When the ayah, the, guy, the hijab came, there's one of the hadith talks about the women, she did not want to take another step. Unless she gets something to cover herself. Okay? So this is how the Sahaba, they took Islam. They did not say, oh, I am a new Muslim, so I have to wait for 13 years of Makkah at time, and then the things will become, the rules will apply to me. There was, you never find any ruling like that, that when the people were entering to Islam, they were going through the stages of, no, I am a new Muslim, so I, I'm okay. it's okay for me to continue not to pray, continue not to fast, or continue to, to be dealing with riba, or this and that, and that. No, it was continued right away. Whenever the rule was applied, uh, whenever that person entered into the fold of Islam, he's entering into Islam completely. Yes, there will be a time for a person to learn. There's no doubt about that. We learn over the time, and we apply. But whenever we are undertaking an action, we have to know what the rule is. So this is what we see in Medina. So let's, don't think of this way. Oh, Medina society changed over the time. No, they, it changed over the time, meaning whenever they were coming across any issue, they were dealt by the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it was through the Quran 
all from the Sunnah of Rasulullah because we know that the Quran and the Sunnah both are from uh, the Wahi. Okay. <coughs> I have 10 minutes, right? Five minutes? All right. Uh, when it comes to Mushrikeen in Medina, so I'll do quickly. Uh, they, they were, uh, in general, uh, there were still people who were on the, you can say on the border, they were trying to figure out what is this new religion, and uh, some of them, uh, they, they, they continued to be on, uh, on the shirk that they were involved in. Uh, but they were watching. Um, uh, most of them were sincerely watching. But they were a band, band of group, a, a group of people who were uh, including Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. As the Sira book talks about him, that uh, he was, the, the, uh, Aus and Khazraj, they were fighting for years, and now they were about to, uh, they, they agreed upon him to be the leader now. They were about to crown him. They prepared a crown for him even. And when Rasulullah came to Medina, and he became the, the, the sole ruler of Medina, that left a, uh, a grudge in the heart of uh, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, and what he did was he continued to be uh, a mushrik, and then uh, after Badr, when he saw that the Muslims are really ga gaining power, so now he became, uh, he accepted Islam from uh, at least the, uh, the face value, and he continued to be a kafir. Uh, so there, there's a group of people who, became, there's a new group of kuffar came into existence, which were munafiqeen now at this point which Muslims did not face in Mecca. In Medina, when Muslims had the power, now they started seeing there is another group of people which were the hypocrites or the munafiqeen. Okay, when it comes to uh, uh, Yahud, there were three main uh, uh, tribes of, of, uh, of, the, of the Jews or the Yahud at, at that time. One was Banu Qaynuqa, uh, and they were the allies of Hazrat, Banu Nadir, and the third one was Banu Quraida. And they were the allied, uh, allies of Al Aus, which is Al Aus is a tribe from the Ansar. Now, the Ansar, uh, uh, most of them became Muslim from uh, Al Aus and Al Khazraj. But one tribe was, uh, Al Khazraj was uh, allied with Khainuqa, and uh, sorry, Al, Al Khazraj was uh, with, with Banu Khainuqa, and Al Aus was with uh, Banu Quraida. So these were three tribes. Now, where did they come from, these Jews in general? Uh, they were oppressed by the Byzantines uh, uh, or the people uh, up north, uh, Assyrians and Byzantines. So they took refuge in, in Medina. And subhanAllah, this is, uh, of course, the, the, the mushrikeen at that time, but in the future uh, years also, when the Muslims had authority, uh, in the time of Khulfa Rashidin and then Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbasiyah, and of Mania, we find that many times the, the Yahud, they went through very difficult times uh, by the Europeans, by the Byzantines, and, the, uh, uh, and Muslims were the ones who gave them the support. They are the ones who gave them the protection. They protected them. Now, uh, even prior to that, they came to Medina and they were living there. So there were three different uh, main groups, but they, these people were, uh, in general, they kind of were mixed up with the Arabs, but they kept their unique identity. Even though they were marrying with the, with the Arabs also, they, were, they had names like Arabs as well. But they kept their unique identity. And they looked down at the Mushrikeen. They looked down at the Arabs also at that time. Uh, and uh, in general, they used to think of it, it is halal for them to, to, uh, to steal or to, to take or usurp the wealth of the Arabs. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَا فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ Ummiyin, they refer, used to refer to the Arabs, that these are the illiterate people, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the sabil, وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَالْكَذِبَ هُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they used to say lies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah is the one who gave them the authority to go and steal the wealth, or to usurp the wealth, or, or cheat them, and all those things. That was not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told them, anything like that. Okay, and then, uh, uh, in general, they did not, they had no... Uh, zeal or nothing to spread their deen. And we know that one of the things is, when it comes to Judaism, in reality, uh, they go by, it's kind of like a race. The mo mother has to be a Jew to be a Jew. Nowadays, of course, there's conversion ways also. And then, uh, okay, so they, they, they were not into that. Uh, they were too much into for, uh, uh, fortune telling, uh, witchcraft, magic, uh, secret arts, and uh, 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 they, they were too much into earning the wealth. 
and they were using many means, including uh, giving loans to the Arabs uh, at that time, and then taking multiple fold interest on it. And the, by, uh, by giving that, they used to, uh, if they cannot pay back, then they would take their lands or the, their gardens, orchards, and then they, they, they slowly and gradually they took over the wealth of, of the Arabs at that time. Uh, and then uh, um, also they used to, they used to create uh, s uh, problems between the tribes. And when they would fight with each other, these, the, the, the Yahud at that time, they would start uh, financing the wars. So they continued to fight, and now they are under their debt. And uh, after that, because they could not pay back the debts, they start taking their lands, uh, whatever farmlands uh, they had in Medina, they started taking over all. Okay, uh, now there are two quick stories and then we'll stop. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, this one I talked about, that this is mentioned by Ibn Hisham. It says that when Rasulullah came and uh, uh, Sophia bin Uyay bin Akhtab, she was the wife of Rasulullah later on, she's the one who's reporting that she was the most beloved child of the family. For the father and for the uncle, if there are more children around them, they will go and pick her up. So now, uh, when the Sulasam came right away, they want to go ch check out the, uh, who's this prophet. Because they were aware of, from their books, a prophet is coming. And they were waiting for, Rasulullah, for, for the prophet, at least, uh, which was Rasulullah in their books, in their uh, scripture. And uh, they went, um, and they, uh, early in the morning, they went to see Rasulullah and by, by the time of uh, the sunset, they came back and the, the, uh, the story talks about like, they looked very tired, the shoulders are dropped and they did not want to do anything and they enter, unlike usual, that they would go and greet and meet Sophia, they did not, they ignored her and she was surprised what's going on. And then she heard the conversation between Ayyub ibn Akhtab, the father of uh, hers, and the uncle Abu Yasir. And Abu Yasir was asking, uh, she, so she said, I heard my uncle Abu Yasir say to my father, is it really he, this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And my she said, my father said, it is he, I swear by Allah. He said by Allah, he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, he asked, uh, uh, he said, did, did you really recognize him? And he said, yes. And he said, what do you have in your heart? And he says, enmity towards him as long as I live. The adawa he will going to have as long as he uh, lives. So he rejected Rasulullah sallallahu uh, uh, As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the Ahlul Kitab, the, the people of the book, they were given all the signs in their book to recognize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa abnahum, that they recognize him as they recognize their children. Okay, another story is, which is the quick one again, and uh, which is about Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu an, and he was uh, one of the most knowledgeable, learned person among the Yahud. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to Medina, and the first day when he found out Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he went he went to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, uh, because he was aware of all the signs given in the scripture, he right away recognized Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he accepted Islam right away. Now, he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the Yahud will not like this, that I am accepting Islam, so why don't you talk, uh, why don't you ask them about me before you tell them that, he said before you tell them about, to tell them about him, that he's a Muslim. So he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam called them up and he started asking the questions that he asked them, what do you think about Abdullah ibn Salam? For, uh, 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 first of all, some offered them Islam, of course, and uh, they did not accept Islam. And then when to ask him about Abdullah ibn Salam, they said um, things like he is, uh, he says, what sort of man Abdullah ibn Salam is amongst you? He said, they said, he is our chief and the son of our chief, and most learned man and the son of the most learned man. So that was their first response about Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam, of course, was hiding, he was not in front of uh, the, the Jews at that time. And then uh, Rasulullah says, what do you think if he should, uh, he should embrace Islam? Yeah, Allah for, they said, Allah forbid he cannot embrace Islam. So he said, what would you think if he should embrace Islam? 
They said, Allah forbid he cannot embrace Islam. And then they said, he said, what would you think if he should embrace three times, he said. And they continued to say he should not. And then Rasulullah asked uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Salam to come out. And he gave the shahada that he has accepted Islam. One of the reports talk about that. Right away, the tone changed. And they start saying, he's the worst among us. And he's the worst, uh, his father was the worst of the worst also. And then, uh, similarly, talked about the knowledge also. They started saying opposite things right away. And that was the first uh, interaction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with the Jews at that time. And they, uh, even though they knew about Rasulullah sallam, but they had the hatred because one of the things that they could thought of it as they, uh, the, the, if, because uh, Rasulullah sallam was from the Arabs, so they would not accept him as the Prophet because he's from the Arabs. Of course, as a Muslim, for us, it has no value a person is Arab or Ajam. We are uh, all same in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing that makes one different from the other is the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who's righteous and who's not. Yeah? So I'll stop here. Inshallah, if there is any question or comment, I'll try to answer. Um, and inshallah, we'll move on next week.